Hello and welcome. This is the CircuitPython Weekly for June 13th, 2022. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Scott and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the hashtag CircuitPythonDev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. Uh, we generally do not look at the text that goes along with the voice channel, which is a new thing in Discord. Um, this meeting typically handle, happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about updated, upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive those notifications, ask us to add you to the at CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There's a notes doc to accompany the meeting and recording. The notes doc contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. This meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes, so this gives you the option to skip around. After each meeting, we post a link for the next meeting's dis notes document to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python on microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project, and it's a chance to look at the project by the numbers separate from what we've all been up to. The third part is hug reports. It's an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing in the community and taking the time to recognize them. Uh, the fourth part is status updates. It's uh, it's an opportunity to sync up with what we've been working on. Uh, take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been up to in the last week and since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. Uh, lastly, we have In the Weeds. It's an opportunity to, for more long-form discussions. Uh, these discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time is too long for status updates. And that's how the meeting will go. Uh, with that, I'll get started on community news right after I take a timestamp. Um, and switch over. So, community news. Uh, first item on the, uh, is a chance for us to talk about all things CircuitPython, Python, and CPython related. Um, so I'll start here. Uh, the headline for the newsletter tomorrow, from the newsletter tomorrow, is the CircuitPython 8.0.0 Alpha 1 release. Uh, the CircuitPython team, specifically Dan, has re re released the CircuitPython 8.0 Alpha 1 uh, version of CircuitPython. Uh, it is relatively stable, but there will be further additions and fixes before the final release. Note that major number changes such as version, version 7 to version 8 may have application programming, aka programming interface API changes that are incompatible with the previous major version. Uh, in 8.0 so far, um, notable changes are uh, we've added talgrid.contains. Uh, analog in values are full range from 0 to 665535 instead of having zeros on low order bits. Um, one wire is only one wire I.O. and is no longer in bus I.O. or bitbang I.O. Um, gatepad shift has been removed. Please use keypad.shift register keys instead. And we've added .env support, uh, which allows you to do os.getenv uh, values, and they can be set in the .env file on the CircuitPython drive. Uh, next up. We have a bit of a tease. So we have, uh, we, Phil likes to create <laughs> circuit Python posters for every major version. And we've got a final version internally uh, for this. So um, we're pretty excited about it. Uh, and this newsletter is gonna be the, the, the announcement of what the circuit Python 8 uh, poster is. And it's pretty exciting because it's a collaboration with a 
company that we are not going to quite tell you. Uh, and it shows the CircuitPython togetherness. Like uh, some example previous posters along this theme were our kind of like co-poster for seven with MicroPython, and then uh, six was also with Nordic. So um, we've got another company working with us on CircuitPython eight poster. So that's going to be very exciting. Um, so subscribe to the newsletter if you haven't yet. Um, to do that, you can go to adafruitdaily.com and select Python for microcontrollers. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but uh, since I'm teasing it, I might as well tell you. Uh, you could also look at, after tomorrow at circuit, or adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython, I think is where it will be if you don't, uh, don't end up subscribing. Um, okay, another time code. Uh, next up, we have uh, PyLeap is available in the Apple App Store. The PyLeap app is available on the Apple App Store for iOS, iPad devices. Uh, there's a blog post about it. Take complete projects from the Adafruit Learn system and transfer them directly to a Circuit Playground Bluefruit microcontroller board uh, without opening a code editor or connecting to a computer. PyLeap is Adafruit's app for iOS and iPadOS. It allows programming a Circuit Playground Bluefruit anywhere uh, with various completed projects, including sending rainbows to your Circuit Playground Bluefruit, loading up sound files, and using light and sound sensors. Um, PyLeap is available on the App Store. Uh, I believe it works with Clue as well. So it's Circuit Playground Bluefruit and also Clue. And, and it works wirelessly over Bluetooth low energy. Um, okay, next up, and Katni confirms that it works for the clue as well. Uh, next up, we have Pi Ohio has Pi Ohio <laughs> say that five times fast uh, has announced their talks uh, for Pi Ohio 2022. It'll be online July 30th with streaming talks and community discussion. Uh, there's a link there at piohio.org, and uh, there's info via. Twitter as well. And note that CircuitPython team member Katni will be giving a talk, Simplicity and Fun Learning with CircuitPython. Um, next up, the PSF uh, board election dates for 2022 have been announced. Um, the PSF board elections are a chance for the community to help find the next batch of folks to steer the PSF. This year, there are four seats open on the PSF board. You can see who's on the board currently at uh, on python.org. Nominations for the new board members opens June 1st. Uh, the timeline is nominations open June 1st. The cutoff for nominations is June 15th, so in two days. Um, and these are marked as anywhere on Earth, AOE. Um, that's when the voter application cutoff date is as well, June 15th. The candidates are announced the next day on the 16th. Voting starts the 20th and ends the 30th. Nominations should be made through a form on the python.org site, and you will need a python.org account to do that as well. You can nominate yourself or someone else, but no one will be forced to run, so you may want to consider reaching out to someone before nominating them. And thank you to Foamy Guy for putting the links in. Uh, next up, um, more CPython news. Uh, Python 3.11 speed up benchmarks. Last month, Python 3.11 Beta 1 was released as their first preview of this major update to the Python programming language. Besides new language features and other improvements, Python 3.11 performance is looking fantastic with very nice performance up uplift over prior th Python 3 releases. Besides changes affecting the Python language itself, Python 3.11 has been landing performance work from the quote, faster C Python project, end quote, to speed up the reference implementation. Python 3.11 is 10 to 60% faster than Python 3.10, according to the official figures, and a 1.22 times speed up with their standard benchmark. Um, and Pharonix has some info in addition to the Adafruit blog. And with that, um, we should say thank you to Anne for putting all of these juicy details together in our newsletter. The CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. 
to contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub at github.com slash Adafruit slash CircuitPython dash weekly dash newsletter. And there's a, a drafts folder there that you can edit. Or you can submit a, uh, and submit, a, submit a pull request there with the changes. You may also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. And uh, Mr. Certainly is providing a live uh, review saying, really digging the newsletters, a great way to keep up to date. So thank you all, and thanks to Anne for being the editor for that newsletter. Okay, next up. Uh, the state of CircuitPython libraries in Boinka. This is our second section. Um, this is a kind of statistical overview of the health of the project and its subprojects. Uh, really meant to ground us in some numbers that we kind of think are kind of key indicators of the health of everything. So first, uh, uh, overall, we had 25 pull requests merged from 15 different authors. So thank you to all those folks. A couple names that I haven't seen very often or are new are R. Tiley, Isaac Ben, and Shamaloon. Uh, thank you to those uh, new folks in particular. And thank you to all of our authors. We had seven reviewers, so thank you to our reviewers as well. Um, you make it possible for those authors to get their code merged in, so thank you, reviewers. Uh, Issues-wise, we had 16 closed issues by nine people and 12 open by 11 people, so we're net down four, which is great. And we're starting to hit the double digits on the number of people doing issues, so that's very cool, too. And with that, uh, I'll switch to the next section, which is the core. So the numbers for the core. Uh, we had 12 pull requests merged from 10 different authors, so thank you to all those folks. We had four reviewers. We have 14 open pull requests, which is, uh, I think, down a little bit from last week, which is nice. Um, we do have a, a few of them that are get, getting quite old, so we should take a look at those again as well. Uh, we have five closed issues by three people and six open by six people, so in the core, we're up one for a total of 516 open issues. Uh, we generally use uh, milestones to gauge uh, how... Uh, we're doing in terms of triage and what our priorities are, uh, at least for those of us that are funded by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython, we go by these milestones. Uh, we have two open issues for 7.3x and 45 for 8.0, uh, and no issues not assigned to milestones, so that's pretty good. Uh, we do, we'll definitely want to triage those 8.0 ones because that's a lot uh, to do before we have a stable release, so we'll have to decide on those later. Uh, but for now, we're early enough in 8.0, it's not super urgent. Okay, and with that, I will hand it over to Katni for some numbers about the libraries. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. This section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that begins with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras, including the um, community bundle and our cookie cutter. Over all of those repositories, we had 11 pull requests merged by five different authors and five different reviewers. Of, of those merger pull requests, one of them was 113 days old, so I'm really glad to see that we're still getting through older PRs. And that leaves us with 24 open pull requests. We had 10 closed issues by seven people and five opened by five people, leaving us with 639 open issues. 184 of those are labeled good first issue. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. It has all of this information and more, including a detailed list of the open issues. If you're looking to contribute to um, by reviewing, check out the open PRs. Leave a comment if you have the hardware, test it, and let us know. All of that is helpful. Um, and then we can talk about leveling you up to our review team. If you're looking into contributing in terms of code or documentation, check out the open issues. You can search them by label. Good first issue is a great place to start if you're new to everything. We also have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, which uh, will definitely help you out if you're new to either of those. And we're always available on Discord to help. So don't be intimidated by the process. We want to make sure you can contribute in a way that works for you. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, uh, all of them were updated, which is why the list is way too long to include, as said in the notes. Um, we did a couple patches and uh, it led to um, two sweeping releases across all the libraries. So not any huge deal that happened, um, but that's why it shows if you check the stats that every library was updated. That's <laughs> what I've got. 
Awesome. Thank you, Kenny. I think we do need to make an Eva bot at some point for, for doing releases too. Um, okay. Uh, next up, uh, we're going to ask uh, Maker Melissa for an update on Blinka. Hello. So Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And uh, this week we had two pull requests merged by two authors and two reviewers. There are currently four open pull requests amongst all the repositories. And there was one closed issue by one person and one open by one person, leaving a net of 75 open issues. There are 8,588 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are currently supporting 89 boards. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Okay. And that's it for the State of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. Our next section is Hug Reports. This is the first of two round robins that we do where I will start and then I'll go through the list of folks in the notes doc. Um, if you're marked as text only or lurking, I'll read the notes off. Otherwise, I will call on you and you can unmute and read things off. So Hug Reports is a chance for us to say thank you to folks for the awesome work they've been doing within the community. Um, I will start and then we'll go down the list. So uh, let me take another time code. It's hard. I don't have my numbers labeled on my keyboard, so sometimes I have to think about it. Okay, uh, first up, uh, hug report to Shamaloon for uh, a bunch of additions to the Czech translations. So that's been awesome. Uh, hug report to Gambler for many contributions and reviews. Uh, hug report to Dave Putz for the Pulse in rework and the rework test and review. And a hug report to Kurt E for the Espresso if you aren't fix. And next up, we have notes from C Grover who says group hug. And now we have Dan. Okay, thanks. So um, thanks to R. Tiley, who, as Scott mentioned, is a new contributor. And uh, her PR turned on collections.dec, D-E-Q-U-E, in CircuitPython, which was a thing we should have done a while ago. So thank you. And then a group hug for everyone who's working on library fixes and enhancements. My inbox is filled with library changes and PRs and reviews. It's wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Thanks, Scott. Um, first hug report this week for Dan for making the new uh, beta release, as well as a group hug for everybody that contributed. Um, hug report for a GitHub user, mu-cx, who found a specific issue with some of our example code that had indexes for uh, weekday names that were different than uh, the way that CPython does it and submitted a fix for one of those. Uh, hug report for Tectric for helping resolve uh, an issue that came up in a test case inside Circup uh, with the change that I made last week. And lastly for me, a hug report this week for Kmatch um, who made uh, bitmap tools RotoZoom actually quite a while ago, but I've been playing with it a lot the last few days and continue to find uh, new new and interesting things that it can do that I didn't quite know about. So thanks to Kmatch for that. Awesome. Thank you, Foamy Guy. Next up is Katni. All right. First up, hug to Tactric and Eva for adding scripts to the new tools directory in the Adabot repository. Both of them have been doing a lot of library updates, and um, both of them have developed tools to help with things that the Adabot patching software can't do or that if it misses something or skips something, how to do the cleanup following the patch. Um, so both of them came up with their own tools and uh, they seemed really solid. So I decided we should actually add them to the Adabot uh, repository so that <clears throat> in the future, if other folks want to be able to do these things, uh, these tools are available. To Jerry for continuing to help with my mailbox project. To Mark Gambler for going through the mailbox code with me and providing some pseudocode to illustrate his ideas. And finally, to Dan for a nice chat and for adding some ideas to the mailbox project as well. And that's what I've got. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. Next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, I just want to give a group hug to everyone. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, next up, I have notes from Mark, 
who says, a hug report to Dan H for a quick answer about doubles in CircuitPython. Next up is Tammy. Hello, I just have a group hug for everybody this week. Sweet, thank you, Tammy. Okay, next up is Tectric. So uh, my first one uh, is for all of the maintainers and the regular contributors um, that have made contributing to CircuitPython fun and meaningful um, and, and who got me to this point uh, re recently. Um, new, uh, n new, really, really new is that I'll uh, be, uh, the Adafruit has sponsored um, me to work on CircuitPython uh, part-time. So um, thanks to everyone who, who got me here. So Foamy Guy, who originally organized uh, and managed the type annotation PRs uh, that originally got me hooked into contributing, re contributing regularly, to Katni, who has always had a bunch of library improvement projects, um, and those have kept me going. Um, and for trusting me still to this day, not to squash and rebase anything, um, accidentally, of course, uh, everyone who I've interacted with so far uh, in the community, it's really awesome to just open up the laptop and, and start working on things and, and chatting with people. Um, it's the, the, the community is by far my favorite part. Um, more technically, uh, this week, thanks to Dan for helping me figure out why my Bluetooth, my Bluefruit Connect scripts weren't working. Turns out uh, you can't send, I think it's more than 20 bytes in the app. Um, and that was driving me nuts trying to figure out uh, where there's a bug in my code. Uh, I'm sure there are, but that wasn't it. So, and uh, a group hug. Awesome. Thank you, Tectric. And congrats on the part time sponsorship. All right, that's it for hug reports. Uh, next up, we have status updates. Status updates is uh, also around Robin, but this time we want to hear kind of what you've been working on in the last week and what you're working on in the coming week. Um, although <laughs> I tend to not structure it that way. Um, so I will start for my own update. Um, I merged in the translation changes, uh, including like optimizing uh, the translate function and stuff, but I can't remember if I said that last week, so I thought I'd mention it. I'm just about ready with auto Wi-Fi changes. Uh, so its behavior depends on .env file, so it should be backwards compatible. Basically, if you have your Wi-Fi credentials in the .env file, uh, CircuitPython will join the, the Wi-Fi before user code starts, uh, generally. Um, this is a prerequisite for web workflow stuff because we may want to be on your Wi-Fi uh, while user code's not running. Um, that change also includes terminal I.O. support for the title bar and changes to the default display I.O. group that adds a title bar tile grid. So whereas what we used to do is we used to position Blinka in the upper left and then the uh, like terminal to the right of it, unless it's tall and then it switches around. Um, but basically now what you'll do is you'll get Blinka in the top, you'll get a text or a tile grid next to Blinka that is the title bar. So it, it's not scrolling text. And then below it is all of the scrolling text. Um, and the nice thing about that is that it's a place to put text that you know that will always be on the screen. And in this case of this auto Wi-Fi stuff, we put the uh, IP address of the device there um, or the Wi-Fi status and IP is, is the, the interesting bit. Um, I'm running into some code size issues that I need to, I'll need to resolve before it gets merged in. And then the next step is to work on the basic HTTP server that will be kind of the foundation for the web workflow. Um, it looks like we'll need to add in polling to the sockets, which is kind of unfortunate, um, but we have ways of doing that if we need to. So um, basic HTTP server will uh, do some redirect stuff, some host name checks, um, some super basic authentication, and then uh, you'll be able to push, pull, delete files, and also get connected to the serial output over, over a web socket if all goes to plan uh, in, the, in the longer term. Uh, okay, so that's my status update uh, focused on, on the web workflow stuff. Next up, we have notes from C. Grover that I'll read off. Uh, Seagrover says, I made progress with the display I.O. based RGB matrix brightness slash gamma class. It works nicely for predefined display I.O. objects such as palette, bit, bitmap palettes, labels, and shapes. 
still running into issues trying to get the class to autonomously discover objects by walking the display.io group tree. Also found that creating a modifiable display.io palette class object through inheritance is problematic. Not all of the needed base methods are revealed after instantiation. A head scratcher, particularly given my skill level. Uh, lastly, we'll continue work on one, gaining a better understanding of display.io group tree attributes, and two, defining and describing the palette type inheritance behavior. Even if the answers are not found, there are acceptable workarounds. The current version of the matrix brightness tool process could become very useful. Um, thank you, C. Grover. Next up is Dan. Okay, so as mentioned, I released uh, CircuitPython 8.0.0 Alpha 1. It's not, it's not a milestone so much as just a snapshot of all the changes since we forked um, 7.3x from, it, from the main line. So we just try to keep, every few weeks we try to get a release out. Um, I've been spending most of my time debugging problems with ESP32 SPI, particularly on the matrix portal. Um, it, it seems like there are at least two different problems. Uh, one is related to RGB matrix in particular and the way it works um, internally. And the other is some other problem which has to do with the airlift coprocessor uh, not responding after a while maybe when it's getting commands too fast or something it's not really clear but there are two different things going on here like i can reproduce the second problem without using rgb matrix at all so i'm going to be working on trying to make rgb matrix uh, work better and then also look at the other problems okay sweet thanks dan all right next up we have notes from dexter Dexter says, uh, working with Blinka on the Pi Zero W, uh, 1.3 inch TFT joystick bonnet, and trying out 8.0 and MDNS on the Fun House. Next up is Foamy Guy. Right, thanks, Scott. Uh, last week I updated uh, Circup in order to make it uh, recognize and install libraries on builds of Circup Python that are eight, uh, you know, 8.0 or newer. So any of the builds from main or now the newly at least beta version. Um, I started creating example codes to illustrate uh, some of the stuff that bitmap tools can do. We've we've amassed a collection of uh, interesting manipulation functionalities, but there's not a ton of documentation uh, code, like example code out there. So I'm trying to create some more of those to share. Um, I created a kind of a reaction speed game with a NeoPixel strip where the light will bounce back and forth and there's a big button that you have to press. You try to press the button in order to stop the light in the middle. So it kind of tests, um, you know, how fast you can recognize it and click in the middle. And then it just like speeds up each time. So it gets faster and faster as you keep going. Um, I took that to a, a little art fair event locally here over the weekend and had a couple of folks uh, played it and enjoyed it. I talked with some of them, uh, especially a couple of kids who played it the most about some different improvements to make for that. So that was a lot of fun. Um, this week, uh, continuing some bitmap tools examples, I still have a few more uh, things inside the roto zoom function and then a few more other functions um, to build out examples for. This morning I did some refactoring uh, in a PR for the iter tools library to make it mimic uh, the CPython um, kind of like format better. Uh, I have some touch uh, touch sensors or like touch breakouts, uh, capacitive touch breakouts on the way to do some testing on the NPR one to one library uh, to check on a specific kind of type annotation uh, syntax um, and how it relates with MPY and, and if it can run on the microcontroller. Um, and then lastly this week, uh, I know we still have some older CircuitPython 6 compatibility code for on disk bitmap specifically that is sprinkled around learn guides. Uh, so I figured I would start going through some of that stuff now that we have uh, beta eight out there. Um, I figured it's probably time we can start getting rid of the, uh, the CircuitPython six fallback stuff and just go with seven um, as the main implementation for stuff. So um, I'll be working on that this week. And that's what I got, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Foamy Guy. Next up is Katni. Hello, <clears throat> last week I published the Cutie Pie Pico guide uh, this is an ESP32 chip, so at the moment there's no CircuitPython support 
Um, but there obviously is Arduino and MicroPython support, so the guide covers both of those. Um, check that out if you picked up one of those boards. Uh, I started a, pro a GitHub profile guide. Um, the idea is how to make your GitHub profile memorable um, and representative of you. There's a ton of tools available, um, which I narrowed down to eight out of probably 200 that were available on one in one place. Um, and I'll be highlighting those tools and uh, updating my own GitHub profile in the process so that um, the guide shows it in action as well as explaining you know, where you can find this information. And also talks about what kind of information to add because not everybody knows what to add to a profile. I certainly struggle with that. So that'll be good for me and also good for anybody else who struggles with that. Um, and then the next guide I'm doing is a GitHub Action Status Tower Light guide. Um, I have this little USB tower light and I'm gonna have it match the GitHub Action status of a repository, uh, probably CircuitPython. And um, so the colors will match the status colors. And then otherwise, uh, last Friday to taking my cat to the vet, the blood work came back significantly improved from last time. Um, she has kidney disease and we put her on kidney food and the blood work is apparently excellent now. Um, it just turns out she's very dehydrated and now she needs subcutaneous fluids daily, so that will hopefully not turn into an ordeal. Um, but that was a whole thing that happened at the end of last week. Uh, this weekend I went to Motor City Pride, that was a lot of fun. And then as well, I got the mailbox project working again, but I need to rewire the read switch to the opposite direction from the current one for it to be working properly. We'll be scrambling this week to make the code do what I want it to now that I have the basic code working and I'm definitely going to get some help with that. Um, and finally, my talk was accepted to Pi Ohio. So once I get through the mailbox project, I'll begin to prep for that. Um, recording is due on July 17th, if I remember correctly. So I have a bit of time, but I'm also really, really, really good at leaving everything to the last minute. And that's what I've got. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you on that. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Um, so for me, uh, I worked uh, last week. I worked on the SMT M SMTPE external driver for the uh, it's a touch screen driver for the Raspberry Pi, and am making some progress on that. I tested the TSC two thousand seven touch screen driver, and um, some more, and found my hardware wasn't passing some of the basic tests, so it's possible my touch screen was damaged in storage. Anyway, I have more hardware now, and it's working great. Um, this week will be a short week for me, and I'll be out uh, in the next couple weeks for foot surgery and recovery. And um, before that, though, I'm going to continue working on the touchscreen stuff and go through any guide feedback. And there's time I may look at some of the HT16K33 issues. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, next up is Tammy make th Makes Things. All right. So last week I didn't stream, do any of my Twitch streams because of a combination of work stuff and a recurring internet outage in my neighborhood that has been ridiculous. I've had six multi-hour internet outages in the last two weeks. So thankfully I have a new internet provider now, so hopefully that problem is solved. Um, I figured out how I need to fix the graphics rendering test that I did for my CircuitPython card deck library, so the next time I stream I can fix that. And on Saturday I attended the um, Desert Pi Python meetup and spent some time chatting with some other hardware interested folks and singing the praises of CircuitPython. Um, this week, now that my internet is working again, I want to get back to streaming and adjust my streaming schedule a little bit to be better aligned with my work schedule. Um, I want to keep working on the card deck library and specifically now that I'm into the graphic rendering stuff, I want to get some progress on that. Um, maybe work on some other um, pull request reviews if I have time. And I've been invited to give a demo of CircuitPython at the next Desert Pi meetup in early July. So I need to start figuring out what that would look like and planning for that. And that's what I've got. Awesome. Thank you, Tammy. Do you mind disclosing what your new pro who your new provider is? I switched to Verizon 5G home internet and it's interesting. Um, 
astonishingly fast and so far much more stable than Cox has been. Huh. Yeah, very interesting. I'm getting, I'm getting almost 500 megabit downlink, and I'm getting about 175 megabit uplink on average. Wow. That's awesome. I hope it stays that way. I'll be curious to see, you know, in my non-CircuitPython world, I've been interested yeah, in... Yeah, I will be too, broadband. but it's, it's also has the advantage of being $100 a month cheaper than what I was paying Cox for oh. continuous outages, so... Yeah, that's pretty wild. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. We're spoiled here. You can get fiber for about sixty-five a month. Oh, nice. Yeah, I would get fiber if I could, but I can't get it in my neighborhood. So yeah, yep. You guys need to get on that. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thanks for indulging me. <laughs> for sure. Uh, okay, next up is Tech Trick. Yep. So last week, uh, as mentioned, I added the new script to Adabot, um, and as a bonus, I made them all platform and tool independent scripts. Previously, they relied on the uh, GitHub command line uh, interface, which is great, um, but not but requires additional installation. Um, it's a little bit you know more convoluted. So, um, secondary thank you to Pi GitHub, the Pi GitHub and Git Python projects uh, for for making it really easy to write Python scripts for hooking up to GitHub and use Git respectively. Um, they're fantastic. Uh, also fixed the libraries affected by the Adafruit logging update that happened, I think, uh, last meeting. Um, so there was some cleanup from that. Uh, I also started working on removing gamepad shift, <laughs> as mentioned, is going away in uh, uh, CircuitPython 8 uh, from one of the learn guide examples. As far as I know, there are two more, um, and this is one of them. So uh, I am uh, going to try to get that out of there. Um, and then, uh, also as mentioned, I was, uh, continue, I continued working on the image transfer for the Bluetooth connect library. Um, it's implemented in Arduino. So trying to get it in circuit Python. Um, so this upcoming week, I am hoping to finalize that at the very least get, get something working. Um, I'm, I'm able to send data, um, but, uh, getting them to agree on it is a little more complicated than I thought. Uh, additionally, I have a few GitHub issues uh, that I've opened over the few, last few months, so I'm going to try and burn those down this week. Um, some of them are documentation and other are, are small fixes, so it would just be nice to get that done. And then I feel like I, I've said this for the past few meetings, but um, <laughs> I feel some cleanup required from uh, one of the Adabot patches um, that I have a list of. Um, so that could be fairly quick. I just have to get on it. So I'll try to do that this week as well. And that's all I can have. Sweet. Thank you, Tectric. Uh, and that's it for status updates. Uh, the last section we have here is in the weeds. In the weeds is a chance for us to have any longer form discussion uh, that we want to have. Um, we have two topics here, one I've added and one Mark's added. Um, if folks have other topics, feel free to add them below mine since we're going to take a little time here to talk about other stuff. So Mark, are you around or should I read it off for you? Yeah, I'm here. Great. Uh, so this weekend, just to bring everyone up to speed, I was playing with the GPS module I have and um, realized that it would make a good candidate for async IO. The basics of the library has it calling an update constantly, which would fit that model sort of perfectly. Uh, so while I was already in there, because there's a precision issue currently outstanding that I've got to fix for on my own, I was thinking about, well, can I add async IO support? Uh, but I'm not aware of any libraries that have it today that I could sort of use as a, a template. Um, so what we talked about in Discord this morning very briefly was to create a second library, basically, or file. Uh, I just put, for example, Adafruit GPS async IO, just for example. Um, and then the primary library could support the async IO one. It could just be a subclass wrapping the primary class. But my assumptions with this would still exist in the same MPY file and the same repo, but I'm not sure if that's a correct assumption or if that's how Adafruit would kind of like to see this done. Uh, and so I'm just looking for any comments or concerns, questions. I, I would do it as a completely separate repo. 
And if you need to depend on the original one, then it would be a dependency. Yeah, and it, it, the thing about async is that typically what's going on is that some low-level retreat routine has to be declared async. And then because async is infectious, async def is infectious, then it goes up the chain from that. So I had worked on making an async group. I have like a, a rough draft of an async version of Adafruit requests. And 99% of the code is the same, but there's no way to refactor it to not. Yeah. It's kind of, it, or, you know, I could re kind of refactor the utility parts of it or something. It's really a nuisance. Um, so. Yeah, and I, and I, it kind of makes sense because I'm sure 99% of this would be reused, but also 99% of it is pretty much never going to change. Yeah, I mean, if you think about, you can say like, well, I'd like to duplicate the original API, but you could think about, is there some restructuring of the API that would be different? Uh, I don't know. Or if, if you take the original API, which is maybe a little too high level or something, could that be broken down into something that you could call? Yeah, GPS level? is a pretty simple example. Yeah, yeah. Compared to requests, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Tetric in the chat just posted, is it possible to have a fork of the current library so you can pull the feature updates easily? That's an interesting idea, yeah. Yeah, I think um, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. The same thing's going to be true of, of requests, yeah. So I'd be interesting to, I haven't had, I don't have time to work on the other, on the requests right now, but it, I think it would be interesting. That's a, that's a better first, first library yeah. to look at than 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 cool. requests so if you if you and you could look and see whether i mean i would also look and see whether you see some similar like c python libraries that are async you know there are many request style libraries that are async in in in, in c python but they're they're big they're they're really complicated, like like AIO HD, HTTP AIO AIO HTTP or mm -hmm. there's some other ones too. Asks I think. So maybe see if there's some lower some simpler libraries that are also async and see if there's some way of rethinking the API that would be easier. That's all I could suggest. Yeah. Hey Dan. What? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe uh, to structure it so you can figure uh, uh, in terms of trying to figure it out. Couldn't you make it a? Uh, couldn't you turn the async the uh, GPS library into a package and then make async a separate section of it? Yes, we could do that, and I that's what I originally did in requests. But there's still there's, there's still possibly a lot of code duplication, and it takes up space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got yeah. It. That yeah. Makes yeah. Because if so, the, yeah. in other words, the changes to make async work might not be that small. Right. right exactly. Small right. enough to get away with that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's like just not an add-on. Yeah. One thing I did point out for Mark earlier that I'd bring up here is just that I think it's safe to assume that async stuff is going to run on larger ports or larger boards. So it's okay to have like the async stuff reference the original library, but I wouldn't do the reverse. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense to me. Maybe I'll take a run at it and see how it looks like. Cool. Yeah, 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 I think it would be interesting. No matter what, you'll learn something. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> you could, you could communicate what you learned to us, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah that, that for sure. And okay. just so you know, Dan, I looked at that precision error, so I yeah. also want to try to PR that one in, because, yeah, that's just a, a float limitation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I do think, Mark, that you're exactly right. This is a good test case, because I, I do see a world where we have a lot of async libraries for folks that want to live in that world. The other place to look is maybe look in MicroPython and see what they've done, because they're definitely ahead of us in the async world. Yeah, that makes sense. I'll take a look there, too. I haven't really looked into it a whole lot besides yesterday, so. Yeah, you mm -hmm. could ping Jimmo from CircuitPython Dev and he might have some thoughts for you too. All right. Cool. That's it then. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks.
All right, and last up, I just wanted to, to make a note and tease folks. Um, since I'm kind of like heads down on this web workflow stuff, I think it's time we could think about adding ESP32 support to CircuitPython, kind of in the same vein as the, our C3 support. So if there are folks here that like working in Expressif and have a bunch of ESP32 boards they're interested in supporting, uh, now's the time that we could start merging that in, I think. Um, any folks have comments about that or? I, I was, what is the, like on a, on a vanilla ESP32 board, is there some sort of standard flash size? I was just That's curious. That's a good question. Like if you took like. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like the, what is it? The, there are all these like jelly bean sort of ESP32 boards. Maybe there there's no consistency about how much flash they get. Well, we should probably look at the ESP modules, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. So if we just pull up, like, a... like even the module, like the 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 module we use for the airlift is. Um... We could just support certain boards, like Whippersnapper does. So we use a Room Thirty Two. can't remember the room is without extra something right it's without ps ram i think okay don't they have a product guide and some of these modules are actually marked as like not recommended for new designs, but that might be true of all ESP32. I'm not sure. So it, I think it would be good, maybe not to specifics, do specific boards like Melissa is suggesting, but maybe have minimum requirements. Yeah. Like minimum this much flash. That makes. You sense. might be able to make a generic build, which mm. might save a lot of. If that's what MicroPython does, and I really, I really don't like that. You know, like, <laughs> I, 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 I like specific stuff because then okay. you can customize it. I know you're worried about how many builds we're getting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, I'm worried about that. We right? can solve yeah. that problem. Right. The, the MicroPython situation is ultimately very confusing as well to new folks. Uh, raise my hand here. Okay. Um, because I had to deal with it recently, and uh, that single build thing is um because of how we have provided things in CircuitPython since the beginning, um, it's, it's awkward and uh, it, it took me a bit to figure out that th these two very different boards that I was dealing with use the same MicroPython build. Um, so I kind of agree with Scott. I would rather see board specific things. Well, what I'm thinking about is that, yeah, I'm thinking about people who have their own boards and, uh, it's great to have people boards, a lot of boards, but if we get a lot of like, oh, I made six copies of this board for me and my friends, I'd really rather not spend the, the CI time on that, on those. Mm -hmm. So that, I think we, if, if there's a generic build available to say like, oh, there, or this works with, you know, a room module or something like that. Just say like, you know, if you, if you made a board that basically all it is is a breakout for the room, use this board, use this build first or something and and because a lot of boards are like that they're like oh this is this is basically a carrier board for a, a module right so that's and i think if we express it that way that's fine okay so but i agree right to not express it that way yeah is, is confusing that's 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 guy one of those so I'm looking at their product selector espresso's product selector yeah. and there is one module or maybe it's not a module. But there's only one thing listed with zero flash. That must be just the chip. Yeah. And then the minimum flash after that is four megabytes. Okay. Four, eight, sixteen. Well, that's pretty nice. Yeah. And it's five hundred and twelve K SRAMs. That's nice too. So yeah, I think that's something. Oh yeah, type sock, right? 
so that zero flash one will will be paired with a flash externally. Okay. Um, Did MicroDev or Unexpected Maker make any plain vanilla ESP32 boards? I believe Unexpected Maker does. Like that, so they, the original they might be Tiny in this. Pico is. Yeah. The original Tiny Pico, I think, is is a ESP32. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ESP32 boards. That's why right. this is pretty interesting. And like, with the web workflow, I think it's going to be very cool. Right, right. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe we just say four megs. <laughs> like, if you don't have four megs of flash, then... then the only way you're going to actually get that is if you've used a chip use the chip yourself and put an external flash that's smaller than right. that because all like this list on from espressive still has lists all their older modules as well and they had fours too because so. i think there's one c3 board that has two megabytes right so we should just say like four megabytes. and that's more like because the, the, the c3 is kind of like the esp 8266 replacement. Yeah, that's true. There is a C2. I don't know. Did you hear about I saw that. I did see that. It's not no, really it's available. Delta. Yeah. It's going to be more interesting when we can get our hands on these chips. There's also, they've right. announced like a C6 that does Wi Fi 6 as well. Oh, really? Okay. Um, and an H3 or something. So there's more coming, but it's really a matter of what we can get our hands on, I think. Um, Anyway, that's a tease. It's something I'd like to do at some point, but first I want to get this web workflow stuff going first, and then and then we'll do ESP32 if we haven't gotten to it sooner. But, um, all right. Let me wrap us up. So thank you all. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly for June 13th, 2022. Uh, thank you all for participating. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, then those of us that work on CircuitPython uh, who are paid by Adafruit, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube as, at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. Uh, the next meeting, I believe, is normal. Let me double check. Yep. Um, will be on June 20th, uh, which is a week from today, at the normal time which is 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, this meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time of, or day, you can ask to be added to the at circumpathonistas role on Discord, and you'll get mentioned with notifications about that. Uh, with that, we hope to see you all next week, and have a great week. We'll see you on the Discord. Uh, thank you all. Thanks, everyone. So, Thanks, everyone.